Good afternoon. Hope everybody's doing well. I've got 12 o'clock. Got 12 o'clock by my, my phone, so I'm going to get started. Um, I'll try to avoid that. I've got all sorts of microphones on me. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Um, so I'll start off by introducing myself. I'm Harrison Howard. I'm a surgical oncologist here at South Alabama uh, and the Mitchell Cancer Institute. Um, I'm originally from Birmingham. I've been here in Mobile about six months now. Um, we have been kind of traveling around. I did my fellowship uh, at the John Wayne Cancer Institute, which is in Santa Monica, where I focused a lot on melanoma. And then I've been on staff at, the at uh, Ohio State University at the James uh, Cancer Institute, which is the cancer hospital at Ohio State for the past six years. Uh, but we're very excited to be back in Mobile uh, in Alabama, which is our home. Um, and so I am a surgical oncologist. That means I did a general surgery training and then I spent an extra four years doing research and training to um, specifically take care of cancer patients and operate on people with cancer, usually to remove their cancer. Uh, so I'm trained in pancreas cancer, gastric cancer, thyroid, breast, um, but a lot of my personal interest and a lot of my personal practice over the past six years has been melanoma. So I have a lot of personal interest in it. Um, it has been, uh, there's been an explosion of treatment options for patients with melanoma, particularly advanced melanoma, over the past 10 years. So as many of you probably know, um, there's been, you know, this uh, thing on social media the past couple months over the 10-year challenge, and I thought that was a great model to apply to melanoma, because from 2009 to 2019, we've seen some remarkable changes. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and we'll get started. Um, I do have a relationship with Delcast System. This doesn't affect our talk today. I like to make this point while everybody's eating lunch. As I mentioned, I'm a surgeon. There's going to be pictures from surgery in here, so don't be alarmed <laughs> when you see blood and guts. Um, my kids are often very surprised as they're flipping through my phone, and it's like pictures of kids and the dogs, and then there's like intestine everywhere. So it's uh, <laughs> one of, that's a disclosure. So 2009, what was going on then? Something called Facebook was just getting started. People were switching from MySpace to Facebook. That's done okay. Glee was real popular. Black Eyed Peas had a bunch of hits. Silly bands, who had silly bands? My kids were way into silly bands back then. Uh, we had awesome phones. The iPhone was out in 2009, but it wasn't like as uh, primitive as it is now. Kanye and T-Swift were still in the news. That's when they were kind of battling. One thing that hasn't changed, Alabama was winning 10 years ago. And you can't forget the Jersey Shore. What was it, tan, tan laundry and gym, repeat, something like that? Um, so what about me? In 2009, I was a senior resident at UAB. That's where I did my uh, med school and residency. I was in the process of applying for surgical oncology fellowship. I had much shorter hair, my belly was a little thinner, and occasionally I hung out with people who won gold medals. You guys know who that is? Sean White. Yeah. Um, I was on a ski trip and bumped into him. It was kind of fun. But anyway, um, my wife and I had two kids at the time. This is our <laughs> oldest daughter, Jenny Lou, who was two and a half. Daisy was one and a half. As a sign of the time, that was my Motorola Razor phone. She was, she was answering my pager um, there, so um, I've been doing this a while. What about melanoma? That's what we're here to talk about. What was going on with melanoma in 2009? Pretty much the only treatment we had for melanoma in 2009 was surgery. If you had any chance of beating melanoma, it was with a knife. Um, if you had stage four melanoma, meaning the melanoma had spread to other organs, you had a 25% chance of surviving one year. Most people died in six to nine months. Your chances with stage four disease living five years, about 5%. So stage four melanoma was pretty much a death sentence in 2009. <laughs> These are numbers comparable with pancreas cancer. Most people associate pancreas cancer with really bad outcomes. Melanoma was in the exact same ballpark. We did have some treatments, but none of them worked. Interferon was something we gave. Uh, very controversial. I'd never believed in it. There's some studies that showed in order to save one life, you had to treat 35 patients. The other 34 people died and also had horrible side effects on their way to the grave. So a really bad option. Um, IL-2 was something that people actually did respond to, but it was a very small percentage. And the other people that didn't respond had horrible, horrible, horrible side effects. And then DTIC was decarbazine, a type of chemotherapy um, that also pretty much everybody knew didn't work, but it was all we had. So it was kind of either that or nothing. Clearly, we needed to do better as far as treating melanoma. So in order to understand how we treat it, I think it's important for you guys to understand the natural history of melanoma, how it behaves. Um, one of my mentors used to always say melanoma is the most malignant human 
cancer. And over the years of taking care of it, uh, I believe that to be true. Uh, if you have a five millimeter thick melanoma, which is a melanoma about that big, you've got a 50% chance of dying in five years from it. Um, compare that to a breast cancer. You can have a, a tumor of breast cancer four times that size, about the size of a golf ball, and we can cure that about 95% of the time. So for really small tumors, they can really wreak a lot of havoc. Melanoma can spread everywhere. It can go to other places of the skin. Very commonly, it goes to lymph nodes. It can go to the lung, liver, brain, um, small intestine. I've even seen it spread to the heart. Like any cancer, uh, the key is early diagnosis. When we catch melanoma early, we can almost always cure it. Uh, so that's one of the important things of, of finding it early. So how do you find it? I like to teach the ABCs. Um, I'm going to come over here. Uh, so A is for asymmetric. If you've got a mole uh, and you cut it in half, does the right side look the same as the left side? If it doesn't, that's concerning. Uh, is it have an irregular border, meaning it's jagged? Uh, any mole with a jagged versus a smooth border, we get a little concerned about color. Moles that are black, uh, blue, changing color, those are concerning. And diameter, over six millimeters, which is about the size of a pencil eraser. Um, those are all things that we start to get concerned about, uh, and you should consider biopsying the lesion. Um, I think most importantly is evolution, meaning do you have a mole that's changing? Is it growing? Is it changing color? Is it bleeding? Uh, those are sorts of things um, that get us concerned as physicians to say, ah, this is something that should be biopsied. Now, as a surgeon, most people come to me uh, with their diagnosis in hand. Their primary care doctor or their dermatologist does the biopsy, diagnoses them with melanoma, then they get sent to me for their definitive treatment. Uh, some of the things I look at right off the bat that are important to me, the Breslow depth. What this means is how far does the melanoma go down into the skin? And that's measured simply with millimeters. Uh, that plays a big role in how I treat the tumor. Uh, ulceration is something we look for. Uh, this is a big ulcerated tumor. It means the tumor grows and busts out of the skin. Sometimes it bleeds. Sometimes you can see it when you look at it. Sometimes you can only see that change under the microscope. But we know pe people with ulcerated melanomas do much, much worse than people with non-ulcerated melanomas. And then mitosis. If we see cells under the microscope that are dividing, that suggests the tumor is growing and more aggressive. So these are really the main things that I look at when somebody comes to me with a new melanoma. The depth is important because it makes, it helps me decide how much skin to take around it. When somebody has a skin cancer, we go and we cut skin around it to make sure we get it all, right? And if any of you are aware of had either squamous cell or basal cell cancer, those are the two most common. Basal cell is the most common, followed closely by squamous. Usually we can just go around and just barely get around it, and as long as we get it all, that's fine. Not the case with melanoma. If you have a thin melanoma, less than one millimeter, we take one centimeter or a little under half an inch of skin all the way around it. And that goes up to the thicker melanomas. If it's two millimeters in depth or more, we take a full two centimeters of skin all the way around the mole. That's about an inch of skin all the way around it. So very quickly, you can end up with a, you know, a defect in your skin about this big. And so what this leads to are, are big incisions, and that is related to the way melanoma behaves. So why do we have to take so much skin for a melanoma compared to other skin cancers? So what happens when you have a tumor and you leave it alone? grows, right? It's cancer. Cancers grow. But one of the things melanoma does that's kind of interesting, as it grows and starts to spread, it develops these little satellite lesions around it. We call it satellitosis, okay? These are separate tumors that have spread from the main tumor uh, that are not connected to the main tumor. Sometimes you can see them clinically, meaning I look at the patient's lesion and I can see little spots around it. Most of the time you only see this under the microscope. Um, and so if I went in and just cut out the melanoma I got all the way around it, but just barely, uh, it's conceivable that you could leave these other little tumors behind. Those will continue to grow and spread and cause problems. So we're more aggressive. We take wider margins. In case these are present, we want to get them all. Because if we don't, this is what can happen. And it doesn't project very well. But here is a leg. You can, there's a scar right here from a melanoma that was removed. These are little satellite lesions popping up. This is a more severe case. This is a gentleman with a melanoma that was on his flank, had multiple resections, skin grafts, because it kept coming back, and then it keeps coming back with all these satellite lesions marching up uh, his chest wall. This is a big problem for patients. It's also a big problem for the physicians treating it. This is a big, big problem. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. Uh, so remember this, these 
pictures. So we take care of melanoma by excising it with a bunch of skin around it, but it can also spread. So what happens? Melanoma grows, it gets bigger, and then it starts to spread usually to the lymph nodes first. And once it gets to the lymph nodes, it kind of goes throughout the lymph nodes in that area. And then from the lymph nodes, it will go to um, other organs, brain, lung, lung, liver, wherever. So if it spreads from skin to lymph nodes uh, to organs, there's a thought if we can stop it, either at the skin or in advanced cases when it gets to the lymph nodes and take out the lymph nodes, maybe we can prevent it from going to other places. So this was the surgical strategy for taking care of melanoma in the 80s and mid to late 90s, where we would take off the melanoma, and then if it was a bad one, we'd also take out all the patient's lymph nodes. And when I say lymph nodes, it's usually for melanoma, it's in the neck, in the armpit, or the groin. Um, so lymph nodes are part of your immune system. When kids are, get sick and their mom says, oh, your glands are swollen, well, those are lymph nodes. And they monitor your body for infections, bacteria, anything that's not supposed to be there, and they help mount an immune system to fight whatever's there. Um, it's also a way that cancer likes to spread, particularly melanoma. So what we would do is called an elective lymph node dissection. We would re remove the melanoma from the arm or leg or trunk, wherever it was, and the lymph nodes that were in that area, we'd do a big operation to take all those out as well. And while that helped control disease, what we found was 80% of the people that we were doing this big operation on, guess what? Found out their cancer hadn't spread. So did they really need the operation? Probably not. And despite that, we were subjecting them to the, the side effects of an operation and, and healing. Um, a big problem is lymphedema, which I'm going to get to in a second. These wounds don't heal very well, and they would leave the hospital with a drain. Um, so for those of you who know what lymphedema is, a lot of times it's, most people are aware of it through breast cancer, uh, but when we take out the lymph nodes, it makes your extremity swell. Um, there's various stages of lymphedema. Uh, when we do it in the arm, this is what you get. This is stage one, two, three, four, so you can see the, the left arm here getting progressively more swollen. Clearly, if you have advanced lymphedema, it could be a real problem, and we were causing this in patients. Uh, subsequently, it can happen in the leg, too. If you look at the left leg, you see various stages, and you can see here at the uh, most advanced stage, this is a problem for patients, and they're really worried about it. So what could we do to not subject a lot of patients to a big operation where this, there's about a 25% chance of having this? And in the, in the mid-90s, something called the sentinel lymph node biopsy was developed, uh, and this really changed the game as far as figuring out uh, had melanoma spread in patients that showed up to us. So uh, what does sentinel lymph node biopsy mean and how do we do it? So you have a melanoma here on the arm. The lymph nodes nearby on an arm are going to be in the armpit. And you have these little channels called lymphatic channels. Lymphatic channels are vessels like an, like an artery or a vein, and they connect the skin to lymph nodes. And it's just a way your body keeps track of what's going on. But what happens? When melanoma spreads, it gets in these channels and it travels up to the lymph nodes. And then it kind of finds safe harbor in a lymph node and it can grow and start to spread among the lymph nodes and then so on and so forth. But it will spread in a predictable pattern. It will, from any given spot of skin on your body, it will go to one or two lymph nodes predictably. So how do we find out what those lymph nodes are? Well, that's what this does. Uh, we start by injecting uh, the melanoma site with two things. The first thing we inject is radioactive medicine, okay, around the biopsy. We also inject some blue dye at the time of surgery. And what happens, the dye and the radioactive medicine will travel to the same lymph node the cancer cells would if it was going to spread. And we call that the sentinel node. Um, so what does this look like in real life? This is what I see every day when I'm operating on people. We inject the radioactive medicine in their skin. They go and get some x-rays and come back. And then I have a road map of where I need to go. You can see the outline of a patient here. Here's their neck and head. This is their left shoulder coming down here. Their right shoulder's this way. The really bright spot, it was where the melanoma was, probably on their back. Um, and then what you can see if you look closely, there's a little strand here. That's the lymphatic channel. That's the radioactive medicine streaming through it, ultimately to this lymph node right here. Okay, that's the sentinel node. If this melanoma is gonna spread, it's gonna spread to that lymph node. So I make an incision in their armpit, I dissect down in there, I have a little Geiger counter that detects the radioactive medicine, and so I know I'm on the, right, uh, on the right track. But I also mentioned we inject blue dye, and that's a visual aid to me and my assistants. So when we see blue, we know we're on the right track. How fast does that dye travel? Uh, almost immediate, within minutes. 
so this is a patient of mine that had a melanoma on his brow. The biopsy site's in the middle. You can see the blue dye that was injected here. And you can't see it traveling, but the blue dye went through these lymphatics under the skin, boom, to this lymph node right here, which has turned blue. That's his sentinel node. So we take that out. If you had the Geiger counter and put on that, it would go, it'd go crazy, because from the radioactive medicine too. Um, we send this to the pathologist. They look at it under the microscope, figure out has the cancer spread. What this allows us to do is figure out if their cancer has spread, but it's usually through a small incision with very low side effects. So we find out if it's spread, but minimize what we call morbidity or side effects. Do we improve survival by doing sentinel node biopsy? No, we don't. This has been one of the controversies over this, and people who are, were against sentinel node biopsy would say, well, why are you doing this? You're not making them live longer. But the important thing is it has very significant prognostic significance. And what that means is we know if we do this biopsy and your node is clear, meaning there's no cancer in it, uh, your chance of living is very, very good. This is a survival curve right here. The blue, the blue are people that had a lymph node with no cancer. The red are people that had cancer in the lymph node. And what this means when it goes down, it means a lot of people are dying. We know when it's in your lymph nodes, you have a higher chance of it going to other places. So this is very, very important, especially now as we have more treatments, which we'll get to in a minute, to treat these patients. Is it accurate? It is. Uh, this is accuracy depending on thickness of the melanoma that we talked about going down into the skin. I usually quote patients that this is a test that's about 96% accurate. For all the students in here, if you got a 96% on a test, would you be happy? I'd be happy. That's an A, right? So um, it's not perfect. You miss a couple here and there, but in general, pretty good results. Um, so it's, it's been tried and true. Sentinel node biopsy is a minimally invasive staging procedure. What that means is it's a way to figure out has their cancer spread. It's very accurate, as we talked about, about 96% accurate. It identifies the 15 to 20% of people that show up with a new melanoma that it's spread, but we don't know it because we're talking about cells here, microscopic cells of cancer that is spread. You can't see this on a PET scan. You can't see this on a CAT scan. Uh, the only way you can see it is under a microscope, and we're able to identify these patients in a safe way. It also identifies the 80 to 85% of people who it hasn't spread, and that's very important because we can say, hey, guess what? You're probably gonna do very well, um, and there's obviously um, great um, comfort in that. Completion lymph node dissection. For people, their lymph node did have cancer in it. Typically, what we would do is say, all right, we gotta go back and take out all the lymph nodes now, the bigger operation I was talking about, because if it's in one, it could be in others. Um, this is now very passe. Um, because what we realized is in 88% of the people we went back and did more surgery, gave them the lymphedema and all that kind of stuff, we did not find any more cancer. 88%. It's a B plus if you're counting. Um, so we started to ask, if most of these people don't have any more cancer, do we really need to be operating on them anymore? Uh, and we were able to answer this in 2017. Uh, a study called the MSLT2 looked at this exact question. And this is really the major change in surgery that we've had for melanoma in the past 10 years. It took 2,000 patients from around the globe. This was an international study. I had the opportunity to enroll several patients in this trial. Everybody had a positive sentinel node biopsy, meaning their melanoma had spread to their lymph nodes, but nowhere else. Half of the group didn't have anything else done other than we kept a close eye on them. The other half had the bigger operation, complications, so on and so forth, and then we compared how they did. Guess what? They did exactly the same. So these are survival curves. The red are people that didn't have more surgery. The blue did have more surgery. I will tell you from looking at a lot of survival curves, these are identical. So we were not helping people by doing more surgery. So what this has led to uh, is that we do the lymph node biopsy, and that's usually it, whether they're positive or negative. Uh, we were not improving survival. Um, and by not operating, we decreased lymphedema rates from about 24 to 6%. Uh, so that was a really important um, study as a surgeon uh, that came out in the past couple of years that's really affected my practice. So the sentinel node biopsy and removing the melanoma, this is all kind of early stuff. What about people that have stage four disease? This is what I was talking about earlier. It's spread. So this is a patient of mine. Uh, this is intestine. This is small bowel coming out of the belly. There's an incision here that you can't see. Uh, and this is melanoma that has spread to their intestine. Uh, for this patient, it was causing a blockage of their intestine and pain. So we went in and cut it out and put their intestine back together uh, and they went on their way. Uh, typically speaking, as I mentioned, surgery was the way we treated this in 2009 because that's all we had. 
Um, and we actually did a study that looked at people with stage four melanoma. This is advanced melanoma now that spread to other organs. The red curve is people we were able to operate on. They actually did much better than the blue curve that are people that couldn't have surgery. Now that could be, it was, it was spread too far, it was too many tumors to take out, or it would involve an operation that's life-threatening. But what we found is the people that we operated on, they had about a 21% chance of living five years. The people that didn't have an operation had about a 7% chance of, of surviving uh, five years. So when this came out in the you know, 2012, we were pretty excited to say, hey, surgery is the best we got. But then about the same time, this article came out in 2010, looking at ipilimumab. Um, and this is a medicine that we gave melanoma patients. The bottom curve is people that didn't get it, and that's pretty much the same curve that I showed you before where they all die within five years. This top curve are the patients that got this new medicine, ipilimumab. And what this shows is they also live, there's about a 20% chance of living five years. Um, so this is immunotherapy. This is the stuff that's all over the news. There's commercials for it. And this was really the first drug. So what is, what is immunotherapy? It's different than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is a poison. When people have cancer, they, you understand that you get chemo, right? But it's poison. It, we're just dumping poison in your body that's trying to kill the tumor. And it's often very effective at that, but it's also effective at killing good normal cells. And that's why people lose their hair and are throwing up and feel crummy and their bone marrow is destroyed because it's the chemotherapy. What immunotherapy does is it affects your own immune system. So the drugs aren't affecting the tumor. The drugs are taking the breaks off your immune system so your immune system can go full tilt and attack the tumor. And the interesting thing about this is you don't lose your immune system, right? You're never without your immune system. So even when you're not getting the drug, your immune system has kind of been trained to attack the melanoma. So even when you finish your treatment, there's thought that your body is probably still attacking any cells that might be floating around. So this has been a really huge paradigm shift in the way we treat cancer. So I told you that we could operate and help people with stage four disease. Now we got a new drug that actually works pretty well. They both improve survival to about 20% at five years. What if we combine them? And this is gonna be a, a theme throughout this talk. Um, we looked at this and we actually found that patients that we could operate and give this new drug ipilimumab, this immunotherapy, all of a sudden, uh, we got their five-year survival up to about 40 to 60%. Let's remember, a few minutes ago, I told you normally these patients had a 5% chance of living five years. Now, all of a sudden, we're up to like 50%. Now, these are very selected patients. This is not the um, majority of patients in this situation, but it's still exciting that we're really making a lot of progress in survival for stage four melanoma in a short period of time. Around the same time, 2010, there was another group of drugs that came out called BRAF inhibitors. Um, this targets a mutation in melanoma. Now, of everybody that has melanoma, about 50% will have the mutation. You have to have the mutation to get this drug or else it won't work. But if you do get this drug, you can see very, very dramatic and fast response. This is a PET scan of a patient with melanoma. All these black dots, this is all cancer cancer, all this. This is their first scan. They got on this drug 15 days later, two weeks. It's pretty much, this is the heart, so that's normal. But like you can see the, the uptake here is very, very slight compared to this. This means that the tumors are dying. So this was also very exciting. The problem with this drug was though, people did great, but then at six months, guess what happened? <laughs> they got, uh, the cancer got immunity to the drug and then they exploded. So we, we've added some drugs to this. This is still a very powerful tool. I'm gonna to come back around a little bit later and talk more about this. Um, but in my mind, immunotherapy has always kind of led the charge. Um, so what happens in medicine? When we have one good medicine, what usually comes along a little bit later? It's like the second generation, right? Somebody's, yeah, so somebody says, oh, this works. Let's see if we can tweak it and come up with something better. Well, sure enough, in about 2015, PD-1 inhibitors came out. Anybody seen commercials for Keytruda on TV? That's what this is, all right? Um, and so we had this other old drug, ipilimumab. Now this new one comes out. So the question is, which one's better? And the way we do that is called a randomized trial. It means you take a group of people, you divide them in two, and half gets one drug, half gets the other. 
what we found was the PD-1 inhibitors, the new drugs, were better. At 12 months, three quarters of patients were alive compared to about 60%. A third responded compared to 12%. And most importantly, adverse events or side effects, much, much lower. So all of a sudden, you had a drug, worked better, lower side effects. Like that's a win-win. That's what you're looking for with any kind of treatment. This was the drug that Jimmy Carter got. I don't know how many of y'all remember, but uh, uh, when was it? 16, 2016 or so, Jimmy Carter was diagnosed with cancer. It was melanoma. It was in his liver and in his brain. He got this exact drug, the PD-1 inhibitor. There's two or three uh, different brands. Uh, but within not long after he completed his treatment, uh, he used what we call NED, no evidence of disease. This is actually a pretty common thing we see with these drugs. It is remarkable. Remember, it used to be you had about six to nine months, six, six to nine months to live in this situation. Now we can't even find his cancer. So this is really significant stuff. So remember how I said the combination thing was a theme? So now we've got two drugs. One's pretty good. The second one's even better. What if we put them together? What would happen? Luckily, there's a lot of smart people in medicine, and they did this. Um, I was not one of them. And what we found was, sure enough, it worked better. The green line is ipilimumab. That's the original immunotherapy. Now, that's a pretty good curve considering where we were in 2009, but PD-1 or nivolumab, it's even better. You got 52% of people surviving three years, which for stage four melanoma is awesome. When you combine the two, it goes up to 58%. Clearly, the best survival is up here. So you think, okay, great, just people with stage four melanoma, we're gonna hammer them with these two drugs and they're gonna do relatively well. Well, that's partially true. So here's the good. Um, when we use the combination therapy of these two new drugs, almost 60% of people responded. That's remarkable. Um, they lived a very long time. Over half were still living at three years. Almost 20% had a complete response. That's what I was talking about with Jimmy Carter. You give him the drug and it goes away. You do all the scans, you do all the stuff, you can't find the tumor anymore. And these are people with a lot of tumor. But there were some problems. 60% of people that got this regimen had very serious side effects. This was a toxic regimen. Um, and the worst part was we killed people with the treatment. These people died from immunotherapy, not from cancer, okay? so. As physicians, when we are killing people with the treatment, we need to pump the brakes a little bit, and we need to be a little selective in who we give the treatment to. So very powerful combination. We use this all the time currently, um, but a lot, of it, a lot of what we have to do involves um, counseling patients so they know, hey, this is not a walk in the park. This, they, there can be serious consequences um, from these drugs. So we talked about early disease. I just kind of jumped to really late disease. Now, we're gonna focus somewhere in the middle. So these are PET scans that show melanoma and lymph nodes. Now when we do sentinel node biopsy, um, it's microscopic tumors we're looking for. You can't feel it, you can't see it, it's not gonna show up on a PET scan. But some people present late. And what I mean by that is maybe they have a melanoma that's been there for a while and they just don't wanna get it treated and it spreads and it starts to grow in their lymph nodes, or somebody that we've treated and it comes back, right? Because that's what cancer does. Even when you get it all, guess what? It comes back sometimes. And so what can happen is people can show up with lymph nodes full of tumor that's melanoma. And when I say full of tumor, they're the size of a golf ball or a baseball. I mean, they're not subtle. Uh, these are two examples. These are PET scans of patients of mine. Uh, this is a cross section of the chest. So this is the heart and the, the black on the sides are the lungs. The bright spot is cancer. That's a big lymph node in the armpit. Here's a different patient. This is a cross section across the pelvis. These are all the pelvic bones and you see these bright spots here. These are big lymph nodes with melanoma in the lymph nodes of the groin. Um, typically speaking, and up until very, very recently, and technically the standard of care now is people show up with this, it hasn't spread anywhere else. Guess what, I can take this out, um, but these are very high risk patients. The, the patients that I showed you just in those PET scans, this is their survival curve. For stage 3C melanoma, which is what they had, you've, at, at five years, there's about a 60% uh, chance you're gonna be dead. So we would see these big lymph nodes, we would take them out. This is a picture from surgery where we did this exact thing. And then you kinda cross your fingers and say your prayers that it doesn't come back. 
And the reality is there's probably a 60 to even 70% chance it is gonna come back. So this is where the lymph nodes live in the leg. This is kind of, this is the, uh, the groin right here. And these are muscles of the thigh. These are hamstring muscles right here. And then these are the major blood vessels going down to the leg and the lymph nodes all live right here. They've been removed obviously. Um, but this is a very, very tough operation for patients to get over. Um, but it's all we really have to, to offer these folks. So we would take it out, but then as I mentioned in 2015 or so, we had this new drug and that was only given to patients where their tumor was everywhere. And now we would take these tumors out of people, but we knew there was a high chance of it coming back. So we said, what if we took the tumors out and then we gave them immunotherapy? Would that decrease the chance of anything coming back? And we did this and it did. Um, so what this means is people lived longer before it came back, it took about nine months longer for tumor to come back when it did come back. People survived. There was about a 65% chance of living five years compared to about 50% um, without the medicine. But again, side effects reared its head. About over half patients had to stop treatment because the side effects were so rough. Particularly with ipilimumab, the really bad uh, side effect we saw with this drug is colonic perforation. It would cause your colon to perforate. That's a life-threatening issue. As a consequence of that, five people died. These are people without cancer because we took it out. The medicine killed them, not us. Uh, or not the, no, well, it was us, but not the, but not the, um, not the cancer. So again, kind of repeating ourselves. Okay, we had the old medicine. Now we've got this other one that's maybe a little bit better. Can we use that instead? Uh, and so we tried that. And again, people were divided into two groups. The PD-1 inhibitor, that's a Jimmy Carter medicine. That's the, the better one. And then ipilimumab, the older one. What we found is after we removed big bulky tumors in lymph nodes, uh, after one year, about three quarters didn't have any evidence of disease, whereas the group that had the older drug, uh, only about 60% didn't have cancer come back. Um, so this one was clearly working better from a cancer standpoint, but also from a side effect profile. Only 25% of patients had uh, severe side effects compared to 55. So over and over again, we're seeing that the, the newer drug, the PD-1 inhibitor, works better which is very exciting. So as I mentioned, um, when people would show up with big nasty tumors as a surgeon, and even our medical oncologists, the theory was surgery, surgery, surgery. The only chance these people have is taking it out. So this is a patient, again, this is a, a CT scan now, similar to a PET scan, but a little different, of the pelvis. This is a huge tumor of melanoma that was started in his lymph node here, and actually grew and ruptured out of his skin and was fungating out of his leg. This is a mess. Um, to do an operation to remove this, we would have to go down through all this tissue down to the bone, cut around here, scrape it off the blood vessels, probably remove muscle here, and then it leaves a great big hole that a plastic surgeon would have to come in and move tissue around to fill in the hole that I would make. This would not be an easy operation. If you go back and remember those, the medicine I mentioned, the BRAF inhibitors, those were the ones that worked really quickly, but then in about six months, everything popped back up. The benefit of it working quickly is we could give it and these tumors would melt away. This is the same patient about three months, eh, three to six months after he started on BRAF inhibitors. This tumor turned into this. Um, I went in and did this operation, took it out. Uh, they found no living melanoma. So the medicine shrunk this thing all the way down, made my operation a lot better, made it a lot easier on the patient, uh, and he did well. I actually just got an email from my nurse practitioner at Ohio State that he's doing well and said hello. Um, so those of us that had seen this phenomenon, we started to say, hmm, we've got patients with big, nasty tumors. They're either we can't take it out or it would be very difficult to take it out. Um, what if we gave them these drugs first? Uh, this was a group at MD Anderson that did this study and they took patients in that exact situation. Um, two thirds got the drugs first, one third went to surgery first. And what we found was the blue line are people that had the drug. They did extraordinarily well. So, and compared to people that just went straight to surgery, this isn't um, survival, this is how quickly the cancer came back. And you can see these people, it came back almost immediately, whereas the people that got the drug did, did much better. Uh, and so this has kind of changed the way we're looking at how we treat melanoma that we know we can take out, but should we treat them first because patients do well. This is called neoadjuvant. Neoadjuvant means you give 
chemo or immunotherapy or whatever, you give that first and then you do an operation second. So that's something that more and more people are doing in all types of cancer. Now we're starting to do it in melanoma. So now in 2019, we're doing the same thing with immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is definitely the drug of choice. Um, it works very well, relatively low side effects. And now what we're, there are clinical trials open where patients are getting the drug first, operating second. Those results are not out yet, but in talking to people that are involved with them um, and from doing some of this myself, uh, we're all very, very optimistic that this is the way treatment of resectable but high-risk melanoma is going to go. I think this will be uh, another study that changes um, the way we practice medicine and, and the way we take care of melanoma. So let's go back. This is the satellitosis or the in-transit disease. This is a difficult problem. So this is, this is all melanoma. These are those satellites I was talking about earlier in the talk. You know, they probably had a melanoma down here and then all this stuff pops up afterwards. You know, what do you do for this? You can't, uh, so uh, number one, amputating their leg is not gonna work. And then what about this guy? This is on his chest. You can't amputate his chest. You're not gonna skin him because what happens is you take all their skin off and where you stop, guess what's gonna pop up at the edge? More of these. So this is a big problem. Um, we are using immunotherapy and the BRAF inhibitors to treat this, but sometimes it doesn't respond. So what else can we do? And so this is one more tool in the tool belt that has happened over the past 10 years, something called TVEC. TVEC is a modified herpes virus. Um, it's modified so it can't really infect you and give you herpes. Um, but what it, it's a, what's called an intralesional therapy, and it's designed to replicate and then destroy tumor cells. So how does it get to the tumor cells? We inject it directly into it. You saw those pictures. People have all these bumps all over their skin. I draw up this medicine in a needle, and, it's, and then I stick it directly into the tumor and inject this medicine in there. Um, in a clinical trial that uh, resulted in this medicine being approved, there was about a 26% response, which doesn't seem great, but it's better than nothing. Um, what we've realized is when we did this, we didn't select the patients well. So we, we were treating patients that this, we know, now know that this is not a good therapy for them. Since then, and we have more experience and we know the right patients to offer it to, uh, we have upwards of about a 60% response rate. And the people that do respond, it often lasts up to 12 months. So it's a durable response. Um, we inject it every two weeks. These are needles into these tumors. There's no limit to the number of, of lesions that we can inject. And we start with the biggest ones and we go to the smallest ones. So this is actually a video of me injecting TVEC. This was a patient of mine at Ohio State. Um, she had about 12 lesions from her, this is her kind of her upper thigh. Um, she had, you know, there, so um, this is a lesion I'm injecting. These are a couple lesions here. The white stuff on top is just some uh, lidocaine cream, uh, some numbing medicine, so to ease the stick of the needle. She had another eight or 10 all the way up and down her leg. And so what we do, see if I can do it, all right. Uh, you stick the needle in. I'm watching very closely on the plunger so I know how much to give. And what you have to spread the medicine through the tumor. You can see the tumor there. Well, I'm going to back out. I'm going to reposition the needle. I'm going to go in and inject more. So you try to spread this medicine all through the tumor. Uh, and we've had remarkable results uh, from doing this. I've got a patient that I'm currently treating with this therapy right now here at the MCI um, and seems to be responding. Um, that patient had about five lesions that did not go completely away. And so ultimately I decided to take her back and remove those lesions surgically. Uh, we sent them to the pathologist and they said there was no viable tumor. So we had killed all the tumor um, with, with these injections. So another really powerful tool for a difficult problem to take care of um, with melanoma. So this is the 10 year challenge, right? Um, so let's look back and kind of look at the changes that have been made from 2009 to 2019 with the way we treat melanoma currently. So we still use sentinel node biopsy. It's the standard of care. Um, but what happened in 2009, if when we did that biopsy and we found tumor, we did, uh, we did more surgery, we put patients at risk of serious side effects, but we weren't improving how well they did. We know that now. So we're actually able to do less surgery, less side effects, patients do the same. That's a big win for the patient, if you ask me. Adjuvant therapy, that's when people have their tumors removed and then we treat them afterwards. In 2009, we had some options, but they were horrible. That's the one I told you you have to treat 35 people to save one. 
horrible side effects. Now we've got a lot of options. We've got PD-1 inhibitor, the Jimmy Carter medicine. We've got ipilimumab, the older one. We can combine the two. Then we also have these BRAF medicines. We've got lots of options. Neoadjuvant, that's treating the tumor before surgery. 2009, forget about it. We had nothing. Now we have the BRAF inhibitors. I showed you that dramatic picture of the tumor going completely away. Uh, we have ongoing trials looking at immunotherapy. Um, and then the intralesional therapy, that's the TVEC, the herpes virus I just showed you uh, in myself injecting. We had some therapies like that, but they were very much unproven. A lot of people didn't believe in them. Uh, now we've got TVEC that has upwards of a 60% response rate, essentially zero side effects, and we know it works and it, and it, and it, has, um, it works for a long time. The most important thing, in my opinion, though, is the bottom line, stage four uh, melanoma, five-year survival in 2009 was 5%. Now it's up to almost 55%. So that's really changing something significantly for patients with all these new medications, figuring out how to balance surgery in these medications, injectables. Uh, so there's, there's been an explosion, literally an explosion, uh, of treatments we have for people with advanced melanoma. It's been fun to be a part of this as it has evolved and my career has evolved. Uh, and it's something that I've been really excited to be a part of. So back to something personal. 2009, these were my daughters, Daisy and Ginny Lou. She was about a year and a half. She was two and a half. This is what they look like now. They've also gained a little brother in the meantime who was not around then. Um, I do want to take a minute to uh, mention our Hope Cup uh, golf tournament. Uh, which is coming up um, in a couple weeks. This is a way we raise money for melanoma research here at, South, at University of South Alabama Mitchell Cancer Institute. We are looking for sponsors, teams, and volunteers. Haley Kroom is here she, and is leading that, and you can contact her if you want more information or would like to help or be involved. Uh, that would be great. Um, and with that, um, a couple minutes early, but everybody likes to get out early usually. Uh, thank you very much. This is my family. If you have questions, you can email me. You're welcome to follow me on Twitter, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have at this point. That's all I got. <laughs>